Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Happy Friday, Food Junkies listeners. This is Clarissa Kennedy, here to give you episode number two with Julia Ross today. Today, Molly and I asked Julia some more clinical questions about how to practically apply some of the amino acid therapy she talked about in our first episode with Vera. So today we dive a little deeper. We ask her to kind of start from the beginning with her personal and professional journey. What was addiction treatment like in the 70s and 80s? And how is that different than how she treats addiction today? We also ask her about the trauma caused to the brain by the frequent junk foods assaults that many of us used to partake in. We wondered how she improved the questionnaire over time. Also, what is that link between stress and cravings? We also asked, how long does the relief from cravings last? When do we need to adjust or return to this protocol? Do we need to take breaks? Can amino acid therapy be used in combination with medication? And here she really gives us some some very helpful answers. We also asked about eating disorders and whether there's particular amino acids that help support eating disorders in the best possible way. And I just want to really encourage anyone starting trialing these amino acid, watch Julia's clinical trials that she has on YouTube and be patient as I certainly scored high in low endorphin and started to implement phenylalanine. It wasn't the right fit for me. I scored the highest in stressed craver, but GABA seemed to make me a little anxious. And it actually turned out that for me, the low serotonin tryptophan was the game changer for me. So pay attention listen, ask questions, and reach out if you need support. Thank you so much for being listeners and enjoy this episode. All right. Welcome to this episode of the Food Junkies podcast. Today, we have Julia Ross from the Craving Cure and the Mood Cure. And like I said in the introduction, she's just, we are so excited to have her on the show. So Julia, Can you share with us your personal and professional journey? Why amino acid nutritional therapy? I'd be glad to share that with you, although it might take a while because I was fortunate enough to be recruited uh, to staff of the first addiction recovery program uh, inpatient residential in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, It was housed in a four-story Victorian on a hill in San Francisco, and the director was very forward-looking but didn't know much about what the possibilities were for developing anything beyond supportive living and 12-step programs. So he gave us carte blanche, and we launched into the most creative development, you know, all kinds of therapy. We got the whole family in. We had groups every night. We did weekend workshops. We had art therapy. It We tried everything we were learning and had learned in graduate school in clinical psychology, which was the most exciting development in psychotherapy, you know, since Freud. And we had a model that we were loosely basing ourselves on, and that model is called the Minnesota model. So it was in the 70s, what was developed in the state of Minnesota, uh, gratis uh, for alcoholics and their families. And there were many inpatient programs, a few outpatient programs, a lot of supportive living after the inpatient programs. And that model had a 50% success rate over time, just with alcoholics. Uh, And we decided we could do better. And so we made a much more elaborate therapeutic program. Everyone was excited about it. Of course, we didn't do Uh, (laughs) follow-up. The the weakness of most clinicians is, uh, you know, they they don't do research well. But 
we were very happy with what we were experiencing and our clients were very happy and we didn't hear back from them. You know, they didn't come back, ask for treatment. A lot of them stayed in the program on an outpatient follow-up kind of basis for a long time. It was lovely. And then in the early 1980s, uh, crack cocaine hit and it hit hard. And there was no one in the country who was claiming any success. I mean, specifically, all of the inpatient programs were reporting 100% relapse within 24 hours. People leaving treatment, not even able to stay for a day or two. And so the whole field really went into state of depression. And we were, we were right there. And we had all these tools, but they weren't working. So we were fortunate enough to be a city that was visited on a regular basis by the neuroscientists in the country was a new field, and they were just going out into the public, uh, specifically uh, those who were addiction specialists, really interested in the brain chemistry behind addiction. They were lecturing to addiction professionals all over the country, and we were on the lecture circuit. And we discovered that the missing piece that was preventing us from helping our clients was neurochemical, that It was the pleasure chemistry in the brains of our addicts that was the hurdle, the problem. The the brain chemistry was not allowing them to get into recovery. It was actually the main cause of their craving experiences. So at that point, we dropped into another state of depression because it, it seemed to us that we would never be able to treat that level of the addiction. And since what we could treat was not working again, you know, sort of a state of despair. And then one of those neuroscientists came around and lectured to us and told us there is one thing, and I've been researching it, and that is that the brain chemistry that is aberrant in addicts can be corrected nutritionally. And the process is really simple. It's very well known. Every biochemist, you know, human biochemist knows that these chemicals that create pleasure uh, in the brain, the neurotransmitters like serotonin and endorphin, are made out of very specific nutrients and not a lot of them. So the chemistry is really, really simple. And I'm doing, this is Dr. Blum saying that he was doing clinical research and he proceeded to tell us how successful it was being just using a simple combination of these amino acids. So Kenneth Blum was our hero. And those of us, few of us in the addiction field who were already working with addiction. So uh, there was someone in Minnesota, Joan Matthews Larson, and I was in San Francisco. We were both employing nutritionists along with all of our psychotherapists, addiction specialists, and so forth to support people nutritionally. But we had noticed that... Uh, over time, they were less and less able to eat a good diet. So that as soon as they tried to put down the cocaine, for example, they would pick up the sugar and and everyone gained 30 pounds in the first 30 days because they were trying to support this crazy brain chemistry with a drug food instead of a street drug. And it was keeping them sober, uh, although obviously unhappy with their body shape, if nothing else. So she and I uh, both began to use these few nutrients. Uh, Really, there was only one nutrient for cocaine addiction that was needed. And so we were familiar with with supplements, you know, were available, uh, readily available. And so we just got some tyrosine, which was the amino acid that fueled the part of the brain that stimulated us and gave us focus and energy and specifically gave us dopamine and norepinephrine. And the minute that we gave our cocaine addicts tyrosine three times a day, morning, mid-morning, mid-afternoon, in relatively moderate even doses, but certainly going up to four, four times, three times a day, we saw a complete turnaround. And so did they. Immediately, they were saying, this is the first time I haven't slipped on crack in two years uh, of hard attempts at recovery. So once we got the crack addiction organized, <laughs> we figured, I don't think any other type of addiction is, is going to be too hard if we can fix this one. So those people continued to get supported counseling. Their families were coming in. There was a lot of damage that had to be repaired just from the years of cocaine addiction. And 
whatever trauma may have you know preceded that. So all of that and 12-step programs, that was all part of it. But without the amino acids, they weren't doing the other stuff. And when they did do the family work, for example, they were just lying, you know, to protect their addiction. And they stopped doing that. You know, they started having genuine interactions with their families and healing could take place. So I've continued to experiment with the nutrient supplements that Dr. Blum uh, introduced us to originally in the late 70s, early 80s. And I've never looked back because uh, I might as well slit my client's throats is my feeling about it as to not tell them and provide them, you know, with at least trials of the amino acids. Yeah. I think that makes sense. I mean, I feel like if I would have been in your position, I would have done a lot of the same, right? When you see that kind of miraculous, like change in somebody, why would you not want to keep showing up and doing that for people and wanting to learn more? And can this apply to other you know, outlets of this disease of addiction. And so I'm really wondering, because I do, and so does Clarissa, we both come from backgrounds of treating addiction and mental health, you know, and now we've transitioned into food specific. And so I'm really curious to know, like, what, what was addiction treatment like in the seventies and eighties versus how you treat it today? You specifically, like, how, how did that differ that experience then versus how you do it now? Or is it still a lot the same? Well, uh, it's a lot easier because, the minute they walk in, uh, they have been, you know, accused of all sorts of character defects and and they are exhibiting them. They are lying, stealing, cheating, and so forth. They go to the 12-step meetings under duress and, uh, you know, often quit uh, or find that the other addicts in the room aren't that happy, even in sobriety, you know, whatever. And so... I just skip that initially and say, you know, we haven't had an easy time with addiction either. And we've had to learn what really worked and what really didn't. And here's what we've learned that we were missing, that everybody you've talked to so far, and we were among them, missed this the central feature of addiction, which is in your brain. There's something wrong with you. Yeah, but it isn't your character. It, 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 it's probably not your past history of trauma either, although they can be combined because trauma does alter brain chemistry. But you, for whatever reason, uh, some, of, some of it was obvious. You know, they came from a long line of alcoholics, you know, so there was a genetic component. And more and more, there's a nutritional component as people's diets deteriorate early on in life. And, and so the brain just isn't being supplied, for whatever reason, with adequate amounts of the nutrients that make you happy that create pleasure in ordinary things so that you don't have to go to the street to find it. And, but in the process of becoming addicted, a lot of, and, and perhaps earlier, you know, especially growing up in an alcoholic family and so forth, there, there's a lot of damage that needs to be repaired. So the first thing we want to do is repair your brain. Meanwhile, we're making a plan of action to support all that, to help your family to recover. They need help. You know, you're not the only one who's suffered uh, because of this disease. And uh, so we're going to do counseling, uh, you and your family, individual group, whatever is seems to be the most appropriate, whatever form of counseling. And we're going to urge you to try the 12-step programs again, uh, especially if we, get, if we have somebody whose use was very social, you know, who, whose only friends were users and so forth, you know, especially single people. At any rate, so uh, we do, you know, full service uh, work, but as soon as we mention brain chemistry, their defensiveness disappears. They, be, they totally focus. They are not to blame. And sometimes their family members, you know, insist that, no, he was always a loser, you know, even as a kid or whatever, you know, but that is unusual. Usually everybody's riveted. There's something new. Well, how long does it take to fix? And when we say it'll start the first day, you'll be able to feel it the first day. And so it's made the whole process so much easier for, you know, adults and and for children too, I have to say, you know, who are addicted. I had a a little girl, uh, 10 years old, who was addicted to mac and cheese uh, and similar uh, dairy and gluten. And her mother uh, had had some serious health problems that went away when she went, got off of those foods. 
And she'd been trying to talk her daughter into going off of them for over a year when they came to us. And she, so she brought her in and uh, the, the kid was in a rage with her mother. And apparently this happened all the time. She was just really angry. And I said, well, why are you angry with your mother? And so she gave me a line, you know, that, and I said, you know what? I don't think that's really why you're angry. As a matter of fact, I think that you wonder why you're angry all the time. Your mother really isn't that bad. And she didn't argue with you. So I said, I think that there's something else going on. I think your brain is making you angry because it's not working quite right. Your brain is supposed to control your mood, you know, how you feel. And it's not doing a very good job right now is what I think. And it, it would be really fun. And it would just take a minute or so, a few minutes, uh, for us to see if I'm right. Would you be willing to try a supplement, very low dose of, uh, of a supplement that gives you more of the brain chemistry that makes you feel happy and sunny and positive? And let's see if it works. Is that okay with you? And she nodded and she, uh, she took, it was a chewable and she had the expected, uh, you know, what actually happened was after a few minutes, she got up and sat on her mother's lap and, uh, then she sang a song <laughs> and the song was you are so beautiful in every way no matter what they said everyone was in tears including her uh, and her mother called the next week and said you know what we don't really need to come in again right now because it's holding you know she's taking this little chewable twice a day and really she's who she used to be and i i asked her um again the other day, whether she'd be willing to try and go off the foods that she's so addicted to and loves so much. And she just said, okay, so no more mac and cheese for this little girl. And she had a similar response to her mother's response, no more tummy aches. And that was the thing her mother was the most concerned about. So, so that's beautiful that that can happen. We love that idea of early intervention. Right. And however, I find when people come to us, they tend to be in that late stage end stage. And, you know, you refer to it in your book as the trauma caused to the brain by the frequent junk food assaults. And so how is the brain traumatized or injured by these food products? Well, I, I was thinking about this and, and I think that the, the best way to explain it is by talking about uh, junk food intoxication. So everybody relates to that. Everybody laughs when you talk about it. You know, why does a whole room full of people burst into laughter or huge smiles when I mention the word chocolate in my lecture? That's all I have to do. So uh, that's a very potent drug effect. But there's a toxic core to it. In order to get, force the brain to overproduce its natural opiates uh, that is what chocolate does. It's got to be uh, overexcited, overstimulated. This is not natural levels of happiness, normal, optimal. And if if these foods just overexcited us and there was no downside, we wouldn't be here talking about it. But the problem is that all of that overexcitement changes the brain chemistry instantly and it can't be sustained. So the brain is ready for this overexcited experience. And after, you know, half an hour, say, sometimes less, sometimes more, it's left on empty. There is no ability to sustain that level of overstimulation. And so the, the signals that the brain starts to give are cravings, depression, anxiety, stress, you know, all of the different kinds of neurotransmitter deficiency that we can feel in terms of mood and in terms of compulsion towards having another experience of intoxication as soon as possible. Yeah. So then that kind of leads me into your work, thinking about how this like can hurt the brain, this injury that can occur or this traumatization because of these foods. And in your books and on your website, you have these craving screens uh, and I'm wondering, are the screens sensitive to these injuries? What should people know and understand how to use these screens? What makes them unique? And how have they changed over the years? Uh, well, when you say screen, some people aren't going in the United States aren't going to know what you mean. <laughs> so I'm going to use the word questionnaire, symptom questionnaire or symptom screen. And this is uh, 
just life-saving tool uh, we found. And it, it had to be developed over time. So when we first met Dr. Blum and started to apply his research with various amino acids, we, we looked at the research on what are the deficiency symptoms of serotonin. We know that we can give people tryptophan or 5-HTP and their serotonin levels will rise, but what does that mean, you know, in real life? And so there were some studies showing, you know, what is adequate serotonin life experienced as, and how does somebody feel whose serotonin levels drop? So serotonin being our natural antidepressant, we call it the inner sunshine uh, neurotransmitter. So we began to build an inventory, you know, okay, uh, here's a study that says they feel depressed, pessimistic, irritable, frightened, panic attacks. So we began to accumulate uh, the research that showed what the deficiency symptoms were like, and then we would compare it to our clients' experience by putting it in a little questionnaire. And over time, we, be, you know, we were we've been able to identify the key symptoms that are almost always there. But some people have, you know, like two thirds of them and there are some they don't have, but in general, none of them, you know, we would throw out anything that most people didn't really identify with. So one of the more recent additions was OCD, for example. Uh, and so we've added and subtracted a little bit and created a five part questionnaire that's simply the symptoms of deficiency in that neurotransmitter. So they're low in serotonin. There are about 10 indicators. And so food craving is right there. But if they're low in serotonin, they also have the mood problems that those foods eliminate. So there's, you know, for one person, a donut would be perfect for an endorphin deficiency type who Oh, pretty sensitive, maybe tears tears up easily, feels lonely and uh, sad, even though life circumstances aren't supportive of that. You know, those circumstances are pretty good. And uh, so when we put those symptoms together with the craving, and then we know which part of their brain is being over-intoxicated and is not producing enough anymore. So what we've done over time is then keep improving it, not so much the symptoms, they've stayed pretty, pretty consistent for years and years now of each of the five types, but we've added um, something that's been invaluable. And that is, instead of a checkoff mark next to the symptom, we have a score between zero and 10. So our food addicts typically come in and one or all of the five symptom lists have very high scores, you know, somewhere between seven and 10 on almost everything, or maybe in three of the five, they really have low scores, which helps us narrow down, well, what do they really need? So maybe if they just were checking off, we wouldn't know, they'd all look the same. But now with the zero to 10, we know, oh yeah, they have that score, but it's, it's a two. And this, you know, this area is uh, mostly tens. And so that's where we start. We've identified what part of that brain is malfunctioning and needs something very specific to eat. Uh, and then we provide it as a supplement. And then every week we have them redo the questionnaires and we watch the numbers go down. So our goal is all zeros. And we reach it now with our food addicts at 95% of the cases within three months. That's great. I mean, I love hearing that. And I think for a lot of people, it's going to give them some hope if they've especially been like maybe struggling or stuck with one particular thing that hasn't been working for them. But one thing I know is like, I can't eliminate the stress in my life. So how are stress and cravings linked? And what are some things we can do uh, to maybe, you know, negate the effects that stress causes? Okay. Well, let's let's just review that we've talked about our natural antidepressant serotonin. We we know some of the symptoms of deficiency there, and we've talked about our natural opiate, the endorphins. So there's a part of the brain that is supposed to supply tranquility. It is our stress reducing neurotransmitter. It's called GABA, and very specifically, it turns off adrenaline. You know, that's one of you know most. That's most of what it does, but 
that means a lot of things are relieved. The tension in the shoulders and neck, the, the, the feeling of overstress and tension, even when the stressful situation has been removed or, you know, they go home after work or, uh, of course, during COVID, there was no escaping it. So um, stress was probably the number one complaint, you know, um, has been for a while. So the first thing we want to know is, have they been using food uh, to over-intoxicate their GABA production? You know, let's assume that they were just overstressed and they don't have enough GABA anymore. And their diet is very unlikely to give them the very food that they need the most to make their neurotransmitters, whether it's serotonin, endorphin, or GABA. And that is protein. So, And that's because protein isn't addictive. It's not going to give you a high. It's going to actually take away uh, some of the pleasure of your addictive food. It's certainly not going to give you that high. So a high carbohydrate, high fat diet, which is what most people are on now and addicted to, almost guarantees the kind of protein deficiency that will make it impossible to, to keep levels of GABA high during a time of constant stress. So how do we know? Uh, we look at the symptoms. They have all these symptoms of overstress. And, and then we try them on some GABA. Turns out the GABA is an amino acid protein fragment as well as a neurotransmitter. So it doesn't even require the kind of transformation that other pro uh, proteins or amino acids have to undergo to become, say, serotonin or endorphin. And in fact, very low doses of GABA uh, work beautifully for, for most people. And so I'm just going to, I'm just talking about uh, trialing a low dose supplement of GABA uh, and getting this almost universal response from people who are overstressed of relief, stress relief. So does that translate to uh, stress, relief of stress eating? Yes. So the brain chemistry malfunction behind stress eating has been corrected. And it's just the most natural transition into normal eating in, and first of all, reduce stress so that you don't experience as much stress as, as easily. And when you do, well, you know, you can take some GABA uh, to, uh, to relieve it. Uh, and so most of these people will take GABA two or three times a day uh, for a certain number of months, however long they need it. Each person is different. And uh, so it most of the time uh, resolves the problem. Now, there are some people that come in with very high stress, but they're not eating over. So it turns out that about 30% of people who are overstressed and in fact deficient in GABA don't re respond entirely to it. And those people have an adrenal overstimulation problem. So they're burned out and they need some attention, some, some glandular attention. And specifically, they have abnormally high levels of cortisol, which is you know, our natural stress coping hormone. And it's typically over secreted. And so they can't let go and they can't sleep. And fortunately, uh, there's an amino acid that corrects that. But first, we do a very simple um, saliva test to measure cortisol levels and throughout the day and night. And then if those things, if the cortisol is too high or too low, then there are some very simple things we can do to correct that. But the vast majority of stress eaters respond to the GABA. Well, that's exciting news for sure, because stress, cra uh, stress craver is what I got. And uh, I've ordered the GABA. Now I've tried GABA before. I think we've talked about that briefly in a previous meeting. So I'm still waiting for that to come, but I'm excited to try that again. And if it doesn't work, then I'm going to try your next suggestion that you had given me. But it is good to know that that there's a course of action that can be taken. You know, again, I, I'm going to use Clarissa's word from earlier. You know, it gives you some hope that even if something isn't working, that there are other things that we can try. It's not just our lot in life to be stressed out and eating over it all the time. There are things that we can do. So I'm wondering, you know, do you, based on your years of working with addiction in general, but also, you know, since I think the 90s in with food addiction, maybe the entire time with food addiction, what do you think or what have you found to be the number one cause, if, if there is a number one cause, of carbohydrate ca cravings? Like, where does that come from 
in particular, like, is there one particular place that seems to really, yeah, come up for you when you think about carbohydrate craving? No, it's not like cocaine craving, which really just overexcites one part of the brain. Um, Carbohydrates, and when we say carbohydrates, carbohydrates are not all alike at all. Uh, And I'd like to just take a, 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 a moment to go down my memory lane, which is, you know, as a child in the 50s, no one was overweight. No one was overeating, but we were having dessert every night and we really liked it. We were having a Coke on the weekends and we were fine with that. You know, we liked it, but we didn't have to have it. And in fact, it, you know, our, our parents were really clear that we need to keep this to a minimum. You know, they, I don't know how they were so clear, but probably because they grew up in the 40s where there wasn't any food, you know, and they know the difference between real food eaten three times a day and this kind of sort of recreational eating. So uh, it turns out that in the 1970s, we for the, were for the first time ever in human history exposed to a new, an entirely new kind of sugar that was 10 times sweeter and more addictive than the table sugar that we had been eating. And that was the, the uh, free fructose. So initially the corn syrup, but also fruit syrups and agave syrup all tremendously high in fructose that is free to roam and do damage and uh, to the entire body, particularly the liver, the brain. And it's, as I said, much more addictive. So it's, it's affecting more of the neurotransmitters. And when you put it together with the other kinds of addictive substances, that for some people it's dairy, it's, it's gluten, uh, you know, so starchy things, it's, it's chocolate, you know, there, you know, there's a variety, there are a variety of foods that will impact the brain in this addictive intoxicating way. And what we've learned, so we started treating food addiction with the neurotransmitter targeted nutrients uh, in the early nineties. Before that, we'd been treating it, but just with, you know, OA and lots of counseling and a diet that removed all trigger foods, but was very generous, unusually generous. And it, it, it worked well for over 70%, you know, even long-term, but that's different than 95%, which is what we see immediately without a lot of struggle now. And what we've seen since we stopped doing any kind of addiction work, except food addiction work in 2014, is that uh, the low endorphin craver, what I call the comfort craver, is the most common kind of single, you know, common denominator uh, among food cravers that they may eat for stress relief also, but this getting the pleasure, getting that enjoy, the joy and enjoyment, you know, they, they talk about it as their best friend. So that's an endorphin effect. And uh, when we can raise endorphin levels naturally in the brain, those desires for comfort and pleasure, and uh, they just disappear. And they feel pleasure, all right, but it's in the kind of traditional foods that gave us pleasure from the beginning. I mean, this is a kind of an, a world of creative cooks, right? With all kinds of fascinating ingredients put together and they're still healthy, but they took all the palate, you know, and, and please us. So there's no deprivation here when your endorphin levels are high enough that you're easily pleased. It doesn't have to be chocolate, you know, it doesn't have to be M&Ms. So when we're talking about implementing some of these, whether it's supplements or, you know, protocols, and then say, how long do we expect to get relief? Should we be doing these screenings ourselves once a week? I mean, we were speaking a little bit before about like, well, you get relief and you almost don't want to let go because you feel like I don't want to go back. But but can we let go of some of these supplements? Because we're afraid the cravings might return, right? Well, we don't want anybody to jump off a cliff uh, and everybody's different. So we wait until that questionnaire or scoring has dropped to pretty much all zeros and that it stayed there at almost all zeros for a few months. And then we suggest, let's say someone has four of the five neurotransmitter deficiencies or the hypoglycemia. We just 
say, let's try one. You know, don't go off of the other three uh, amino acids. Just go, we want you to go off of one, or if that's too scary, then just cut it in half and uh, see how that does for a day. And if you're completely comfortable without it, keep going, but keep filling out that questionnaire so that you're clear that your scores are staying at zero. If they start to creep back up, then it's premature. And you want to go back to your original dose, or maybe at half the dose, you were fine. But when you tried to go off completely, you just weren't ready for that. So there's no reason to rush it unless you, there's a question of what you're maybe over time you, you're getting an adverse because you don't need it anymore and you're still taking it. So occasionally we'll get that. You know, a GABA will make people kind of anxious after you know, a long time. Uh, and they stop the GABA and realize, oh, my stress is gone. I didn't really need it anymore. So it was kind of irritating my brain. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Because that would have been like my follow-up clarification question was going to be, wow, that was a lot of syllables in one sentence. I was going to be like, how long do we try the protocol? But it sounds like we keep going until we get to zero. And then, you know, whether or not we take a break really is determined by get to those zeros and then kind of titrate ourselves down like half a dose, whatever, feel comfortable, but then keep checking in because if those scores start creeping back up or something is going on, we may need to go back to that, that therapy protocol. And, and that can happen, for example, uh, with the our, all of our endorphin, low endorphin cravers, the comfort cravers, if uh, let's say they've, they've gone off or cut their amino acid that raises endorphin levels in half and they're fine and they quit seeing us. And then we hear from them again and they say, you know, my husband died, you know, this has happened, you know, or someone very close and the grief is just too much. And they're starting to think about comfort foods. And we encourage them to go right back, at least temporarily. And what they find is that their grief uh, continues, but it's not at the unbearable. So for whatever reason, they're not the best endorphin producers and under duress, they perhaps they'll never be able to completely face super severe pain without some help. So we're wondering, can amino acid therapy be used in combination with medication? So like if I'm on an antidepressant or someone's on ADHD medications, is there anything that they should be concerned about when, you know, if they want to try these protocols? Yes. The first thing you want to do is get that questionnaire filled out. uh, And uh, one of the columns on the questionnaire uh, lists the kinds of medications that also affect that particular part of the brain, that particular neurotransmitter. So, for example, uh, antidepressants, whether they're SSRIs or SNRIs, target serotonin and activate uh, activate serotonin in you know a, a drug like way. But we have the nutrients that will supply more serotonin. So, without forcing it into overactivity, uh, we can just supply more serotonin, which will have the same effect uh, or better. So we want to know how is your medication, you know, helping you, you know, on, is it relieving 50% of whatever you were experiencing before you got on it or 25% or nothing anymore, but it did in the beginning or, and are you having side effects that are, you know, disturb you? Uh, so for example, some people want to get pregnant, but they don't want to be taking antidepressant while they're pregnant, even if it has helped them. So the first thing we want to know is what kind of a drug is it? What is the target in the brain? And how is it affecting the person? So we don't encourage people to take the antidepressant nutrients, for example, uh, that raise serotonin levels uh, on a regular basis while they're taking serotonin targeted medication. So what do we do? You know, it's up to them. If they're feeling they're getting a lot of benefit, then and not much side effect, then just don't take, you know, that particular nutrient. Uh, And we'll know from their uh, symptom responses whether they are full of serotonin or not, you know, and from their response to the medication. So it's really up to them, but this gives them an alternative. So if they, for example, would like to get off of their antidepressant and, and know whether these amino acids were going to be a viable alternative, then it would be okay to trial the antidepressant amino acid away from the medication by four to six hours. So let's say they take their 
affects her or Zoloft in the morning. So four to six hours you know, later, any time after that, they can trial a dose or two of the tryptophan, which means emptying it out into a little bit of water, swishing it around in their mouths, and then swallowing it and noticing over the next five or 10 minutes how they feel. And so they're not, you know, overdosing on, on it. And it's away from the drug. So uh, we often have them check with psychiatrists, are you okay to trial it like this? And they always say yes. In fact, they always say, well, it's not going to help, but it's not going to hurt you. So that's good enough for us. So then we give them that opportunity. They get to see what it's like, uh, what it would be like if they took that supplement and raised their serotonin levels until they didn't need it anymore, which would you know, require them to get off of the medication gradually. And most psychiatrists are perfectly comfortable with them taking the antidepressant amino acid four to six hours away from the drug. While they're tapering the drug down, uh, they will increase the amount of the amino acid that is indicated as needed. And it usually goes very, very nicely and smoothly. And we don't care how long it takes. You know, we don't want them to rush off the drug and take, you know, too little too quickly. So, you know, gradual taper. And once the medication is out of there, then we can really optimize the dose. And, uh, so it's kind of a complicated answer, but uh, it, it gives you an idea of there are some kinds of medications that are not, that are very use can be very useful, but they're not really neurotransmitter targeted like lithium. So if someone has had a, a really good stabilizing experience with lithium, we would not uh, suggest that they ever go off of it. You know, that is not our arena. Uh, they're working with a doctor who's more familiar with that. Uh, but we would have them ask if in addition to that, it would be okay with their psychiatrist if they trialed some amino acids, if they had symptoms on the questionnaire. I think that's a, a really great I think it's a really great question that you had, Clarissa, but I also think it's a really great answer because we have to understand or, or our listeners need to understand, right, that some folks are going to have some more complicating factors. So when we are on these kind of medications, they're very serious medications and they're not prescribed lightly. So to be working with like this may not be a time, guys, when you want to pick up one of Julia's books and start doing this on your own. This is when you want to reach out to Julia and her trained professionals to work with somebody one on one to get your doctor on board, all of that, because there's just more factors. There are more factors that go into those situations. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Okay. So to bring up another complicating factor, we have definitely, we most likely have listeners, but definitely we've worked with clients who have eating disorder histories. And we're wondering, are the nutritional amino acid therapy protocols appropriate for individuals who maybe are also working to find recovery from eating disorders, whether that be anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, um, orthorexia, any of those kind of more quote unquote traditional eating disorder diagnoses? We don't make a, a, a hard distinction when we're talking about cravings for intoxicating substances uh, that are part of the picture. Then we've found that we give people the same questionnaire and we trial them on the indicated amino acids, and they get a lot of benefit. Now, bulimics uh, definitely uh, do beautifully with this approach. They typically have some problems with digestion. So the diet, you know, they, we have to work with the diet. Sometimes it has to be pureed initially until they get the, you know, the, the stomach and the, the whole digestive, early digestive process normalized. Uh, but uh, in terms of the cravings and the mood problems, uh, bulimics are very responsive. Binge eating is something uh, that we found too often. Of course, there are cravings. So, you know, some of the amino acids can be uh, helpful. But when the person isn't craving all the time, they're craving sporadically. We have often found that they are suffering from uh, some uh, degree of uh, bipolar spectrum disorder. So same with binge drinking, you know, when it's uneven, when it's not always there, that's when we are looking for combining whatever amino acids work with a mood stabilizer. And if they're not already on lithium or lamictal, and there are an awful lot of people 
who are in this category who are not never been diagnosed. But the spectrum is getting wider and wider, and we see a lot of people who we call subclinical bipolar disorder clients. So with them, uh, we would trial them with lithium orotate, which is an over-the-counter, extremely low potency form of lithium, which often works beautifully. And we will, if that's not totally successful, we will refer them for some psychiatric support. Now, with anorexia, that is the most profound nutrient deficiency condition there is. And if you don't give an anorectic aggressive nutrients, you might as well not even begin. We have found that we can't intervene on their compulsion directly. So we don't even talk to them about eating initially. We just talk to them about, okay, we have some non-caloric supplements that will make you feel better. And they, they're dying for that, literally. They want to feel better. They just, you know, are so afraid. So once we get particularly tripping, which is the most easily depleted of all of the amino acids, because there isn't that much, even in the highest protein foods, and it's our antidepressant, anti-compulsion, anti-fear neurotransmitter, it's, it's critical for anorexic, anorexics to get enough of it. And so uh, when we give it to them, and sometimes they need a tremendous amount initially. We had one gal who was uh, a ballerina uh, who, unbeknownst to us, you know, we said start with four tryptophan four times a day, which is aggressive. And she went up to 19 a day, you know, so she went from, she went from uh, 12 to 19. And she only did it one by one. She did it until she said the voice stopped and I didn't need to take any more. And now she said, I'm, I'm calling you because you didn't tell me to go up that high and I did it anyway. And then I was afraid to call you, but now I'm calling you and I'm, I'm, I'm down to the 12. I don't need the, the 19. Just to give you an example of what it can take when the primary problem is, you know, starvation, brain starvation. And I guess what you're saying makes a lot of sense that, you know, this type of nutritional therapy would have such a big impact on bulimia when we look at the research and they say food addiction and bulimia are the most correlated, right? Uh, so a treatment for food addiction makes sense that you would have similar positive results for bulimia. So that, I mean, that just pretty much validates what you do, Julia. <laughs> so can you let us know uh, where can our listeners find you? Well, uh, they they can um, search on uh, Craving Cure, uh, and all of my books and all of my information is all on one uh, website now. It's julierosscures.com, but uh, I would want them to go right to the Craving Cure section of that website and get the book. It's my most recent book, but the questionnaire that is, you know, the questionnaire we've been talking about, the screen we've been talking about. Uh, is on the website. So this five-part screen, they can take it and uh, right there, they can get some more information about what else to do. And I, I should say that part of uh, this our initial screen is to identify if there are any amino acids that they shouldn't take. You know, do they have any conditions or, uh, you know, are they pregnant, for example? That really limits the kind of amino acids people can take. So that's got to be factored in. And uh, there's uh, chapters 11 and 12 in the Craving Cure are the how-to chapters. So a lot of people just take the question and they go right to those chapters and get a lot of guidance. And then our virtual clinic is always there to support at any point. You know, some people call us and say, everything's really great, but there's this whole termination thing. And would you help me figure out how to terminate without relapsing. So there are, you know, lots of pieces that that uh, may come up or somebody has kids, you know, they're doing really well. They want to get their kids on board, but they're not so sure about the dosing for kids. And it, in fact, is less. So uh, teenagers over 14 and over are typically adult doses, but uh, the younger, the, the lower the dose needs to be and the shorter they need it, the shorter time. Amazing. Well, we'll make sure to get that all in the show notes so that people can find you easily and hopefully reach out and get some help. Thank but you. before you go, we have a signature question that we like to ask all of our guests. We always tailor it to our guests. 
But for you today, we were wondering if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about food addiction, what would it be? Well, I was always too thin. And as I say, I was raised in the 50s and 60s where nobody was really overweight. And the people who were going to get teased, if they were going to get teased, were people who were so thin. So I had no understanding of weight problems or overeating problems when I got, uh, you know, went to graduate school and, and learned to be an addiction counselor. And there was no training in food addiction at all. So actually, a, one of my staff members came to me and she was in Overeaters Anonymous and said, we need help. Just like you're helping people in AA and NA and CA and whatever, uh, we need help. And she began to take me to meetings and so forth. So I would say the most important thing is that I finally learned that addiction is involuntary and food addiction is no different. In fact, it's more involuntary. There, People have more motivation to not overeat. Nobody wants to gain weight in this culture. But I was into the common um, approach to overeating and overweight, which was blaming, you know, well, what's the matter with them for heaven's sake, you know, kind of thing. And so I would spare uh, my clients that I, I actually was smart enough to hire eating disorders specialists rather than try and do it myself. But as much as possible, uh, I would love to spare people the blame and the self-hate and, and of course, the ill health and the, the death, you know, by diabetes and everything that goes along with it. And we do, you know, as a culture, tend to blame people, even though the majority of the population is now overweight, 80% and half di diagnosed with some form of diabetes. So to, to be so clear that there is a clear cut solution and it doesn't have to do with changing your character or, yeah. Yeah. Sounds like reducing the stigma, which is exactly what we want to do in this field, right? And and just get out of that shame and give people hope and, and solutions. Right. Thank you so much for being here today, Julia. Thank you, Julia. My pleasure. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one -on -one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours. <laughs>